Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadharan. Fighting between Israel and Palestine has flared up, it seems, all of a sudden. And uh, from all the reports you read, it seems it's worse than what it was in 2014, when uh, more than 2,000 Palestinians were killed and were 70 or Israeli uh, or 80 Israeli lives were also lost. Uh, so why is this happening and uh, exactly what is it all about? I have with me Mr. Talmiz Ahmed, India's former ambassador to Saudi Arabia. He knows the region extremely well and is a well-known scholar, a well-reputed scholar on Arab-Israeli issues. Uh, sir, welcome. Uh, glad to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, how do you explain the current um, uh, fighting? You know, I mean, it seems to have flared up all of a sudden, you know, beginning with some incidents at the Al-Aqsa Mosque and now suddenly into full-scale uh, war, it seems. Yes, there are certain, uh, we are still at very early days and all information is not available just yet. The background is that eviction notices were sent to certain families who live in East Jerusalem, in the area known as Sheikh Jarrah. Now, this is a very old issue. It is part of Israel wanting to remove Arabs from East Jerusalem and integrate it uh, wholly with West Jerusalem and create a Jewish community rather than an Arab community, which is very significantly located in East Jerusalem. This is the background. The families concerned have very detailed documentation about their legal ownership of the properties, but much of this documentation that goes back to the Ottoman period is not recognized as legal in the Israeli courts. So this is the immediate background, the eviction notices that have been given. And several thousand people live there, Palestinians live there, so they are obviously very legitimately concerned that they would be thrown out. And this was part of the ongoing settlement activity, which we have seen earlier in the West Bank. The second thing that happened is that unexpectedly, Israeli police blockaded the entrance into Damascus Gate, into the old city of Jerusalem. Now, this is the period of the Ramadan, and usually yeah. in the evenings, this is the practice of people to gather in these communities for a chat. So perhaps this was a seen as a very vocative action. So there was a certain degree of rumbling uh, because of the eviction and the closure of the Damascus Gate. And some rioting started taking place in the region. And that is, uh, that is what happened. Now, it is in this background that Hamas started sending rockets into Jerusalem. They issued earlier warnings and gave the exact time as well. There was a third provocation I should mention. And on 10th May, every year, Israeli right-wingers organize what is called Jerusalem Day. This is the mm -hmm. day on which Jerusalem, uh, where in East Jerusalem was occupied by Israel in 1967. Every year, these people carry out a very long march uh, and they go through Muslim localities and they shout provocative slogans. This so year, something, uh, something disruptive happened. Hamas fired rockets at the time of the demonstration. Just before the demonstration started, the government slightly changed the route. So there was a, there was a certain impact felt by the Israelis for the first time in several mm -hmm. years, changed the route. But when the, when the rockets came, their march was slightly disrupted as well. This is the background, mm -hmm. the immediate background to what is happening at the moment, uh, you know, in Israel so, and in Gaza. Yeah. So something seems to have changed in the manner in which the Israeli Arabs and the Palestinians are reacting. You know, we have violence by Israeli Arabs and Palestinians in Lod, in Acre and a couple of other places. An emergency has been declared in Lod. Uh, do you mean to say something has changed in the Arab attitude? Is, is it correct? What has surprised people is there is a new sense of empowerment. If you hmm. see with the decline of Benjamin Netanyahu, there is a now a new sense that 20% of Israel is made up of Arabs or Palestinians who have mm -hmm. Israeli nationality. Today, yeah. in the polarized and splintered politics of Israel, you see a sense of empowerment that governments in Tel Aviv are now seeking, 
they're seeking the participation of the Arab. If you remember during the election campaign, Netanyahu made a major effort to reach yeah, out yeah. to the Arab. He went yeah. to Arab area where he had never gone before. He spoke about improving the law and order situation, improving developmental activities, etc. And also the alternative prime minister who has been asked to form the government, Yair Lapid, his coalition partner could be an Arab as well. So I think, yes, you are right. There is a new sense of empowerment among the Arab Israelis, and they are rejecting robustly the second-class status that has been imposed upon them by these traditional Israeli politics so far. Mm -hmm. And in this empowerment, do you detect a sense that they can expect something, some justice from the Israeli government? Is that the expectation also? At the moment, there is no Israeli government, number one. Yeah. Israel has been ruled for the last 20 years by an extreme right-wing coalition, initially yeah. with Ariel Sharon, and then, of course, with Benjamin Netanyahu. They have shaped Israeli politics for the last two decades that is robustly affiliated with the, with the ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, communities and Jewish political parties. And they have no compromise. They, they do not have any scope for compromise in their political order. So now we are looking possibly at change. If Netanyahu withdraws from the political scene and faces up to the criminal charges that he is facing, and an alternative government comes up, at some stage, not immediately, but at some stage, you could see a new approach, a new Israeli politics, which Benjamin Netanyahu has made impossible up to now. Okay. Now, another point, sir. In the, uh, it, it seems from some of the reports that I'm reading that the Israeli establishment was taken by surprise with the uh, rocket attacks from Hamas. You know, I mean, there seems to be a certain lack of uh, unpreparedness. Would, is that correct? What they were surprised at is the Hamas's boldness that mm. they gave a precise time frame, a particular occasion. They identified the target and exactly on schedule, they unleashed their rocket. These were largely symbolic. They were symbolic. They disrupted the march for a while. They were signaling yeah. that, look, there are limits, there are constraints to what you can do. Israel, of course, has responded in the only way it does. Because yeah. once there is a military confrontation, it's no holds barred for them. And you have seen uh, on the television screen the extra, uh, I mean, the rampant uh, destruction that they have unleashed upon Gaza. And this is on par with what they had done in 2014. And it remains to be seen whether it will escalate or it will be controlled. Mm -hmm. So what I find interesting is that in a small place like Gaza, you know, and one presumes the Israeli intelligence is very good. They would have penetrated that entire uh, territory. Yet Hamas has been able to uh, build and, uh, you know, so many rockets and unleash them in the, in the barrage that they are uh, doing so. It's odd, curious, isn't it? Uh, you are right. Israel has deep penetration uh, from its intelligence services and a whole range of informers uh, uh, with regard to what is happening, not only in the occupied territories, but in many other Arab countries as well. You are aware that Israel has carried out assassinations far away in Iran as well as in the UAE and even uh, some time back in North Africa. So Israel, yes, is usually well informed. What they were, they seem to have made a mistake, and they are discussing that they had been assured that there would be no violence from the one who has taken over the leadership of Hamas in the recent mm -hmm. Hamas election. But what they did not note was that the military commander had given no such assurance, and it is the military commander who is possibly leading from the front. There is no reason why it should continue to escalate. Israel is in the throes of forming a government. And mm -hmm. this government has the potential to effect very major changes in the Israeli political order. Therefore, I think that the political process might be given an opportunity. Each side has made its point of view clear. The issues remain unresolved as they have been unresolved for the last 50 years or so. They will remain unresolved for the time being. But at least there is no need to further escalate uh, the fighting on the ground. 
Mm-hmm. Now, Israeli um, Israel has claimed that they've uh, knocked off uh, quite a few Hamas senior commanders. So I would presume that their penetration of Hamas ranks is pretty good. Um, is, that, is, that, uh, is that accurate? This is not absolutely. I think Hamas itself has admitted also that many of its senior officials have been killed. Uh, mm-hmm. And Israel has said that as well. Uh, you see, uh, Hamas has been at the receiving end of Israeli violence almost consistently. You are yeah. aware of the assassinations that have been carried out over the last 20 years or so. Even those people who were killed in the UAE in Dubai by the assassination squad, they were from Hamas. Israel has a, a, a deep uh, respect for Hamas. Hamas actually exemplifies to the Israeli the very quality that they themselves celebrate in themselves. Yes. Uh, is, uh, Hamas is a disciplined organization. It is very highly motivated and committed. Uh, it What it lacks as compared to the Israeli their firepower. And some of that change is already happening in the region. So I presume this could give them the uh, maneuver to make those changes internally too. It's very difficult to say at this stage. Uh, there is a hint of change. It's like a first cool breeze blows, and you know mm. that winter, that cool breezes may herald a good weather mm. some stage. Uh, what is happening is the pre- Netanyahu could not form the government after the recent elections. Yeah, and the president, as per their constitution, has called on uh, Yer Lapid to form the government. Yer Lapid and Naftali Bennett have made tremendous progress and they have co-opted. It's a, uh, it's a center-left coalition. They have co-opted the Arab group Ram. Ram. Yeah. It is an Islamist group led by Mansoor Abbas. So you have this. It's a completely novel development. It's novel yeah. for the following reasons. Number one, there is no Benjamin Netanyahu. Number two, <laughs> In this coalition, there are no ultra-Orthodox parties. And number three, there is an Arab group, which is an Islamist group. So it is Mm. the first cousin of the Hamas. Now, this fighting has set back the political process. Uh, uh, Mansoor Abbas had no choice but to inform uh, Bennett and Yar Lapid that uh, I cannot continue the discussion. I mean, while violence is being perpetrated against Hamas, he cannot be discussing uh, participation in government. So that yeah. is why I personally feel that if they could just hold back. Now, there is, in fact, a conspiracy theory circulating in Israel that Netanyahu engineered this. I don't think that is the case. I think there is a set of circumstances which got out of hand. Uh, it may be a coincidence that it happened just when they were forming the government. In fact, they needed just a day or so to form the government. And if the violence continues, you could they may have to inform the president they couldn't form the government, and Israel may say may face another round of election. <laughs> but in that period, Netanyahu will remain prime minister for yeah, another yeah, six absolutely. months. So there we go. I think wisdom now, good sense and wisdom have never been obvious in the Israel Palestine issue. Let me be very yeah. clear here. But having True. said this, let us be that if they were to form the government and that the Arab party, Ram, is a part of the government, you would see a sea change. Already literature has emerged. That some, if you don't have this ultra-orthodox, you and you have Biden wanting to put a halt to this settlement business. It's the most provocative yeah. thing that has happened. He may not yeah. reverse Jerusalem. And I think Jerusalem is already a lost story, though I think the transition could be better handled. Uh, True. What I have read is that they may need their, this this coalition, provided it is sustainable in Parliament in the in the Knesset. Uh, they are they would need to take a fresh look at relations with the Israelis. For example, the other thing they are talking about that we must now re uh, we must take a fresh look at our ties with the Iranians and with the nuclear agreement. This kind yeah. of sulking in the corner of Tel Aviv, saying that no no agreement, no agreement, no agreement yeah, yeah. is today not a realistic approach, particularly yeah. when the Americans are so deeply engaged. And finally, 
re-engage with the Americans. You see what they have done. The, uh, the support for the extreme right wing in Israel among American Jews has diminished quite significantly. Mm-hmm. So in this context, what uh, Netanyahu did was not to bother about the Jewish community, but to focus on the right wing individuals uh, like mm-hmm. Sheldon Adelson. Also, he got support from the Christian evangelists. Biden is not n- neither bothered about the Christian evangelists nor the extreme right wing community. Yeah. So he is in a better position. I think these the sensible Israelis recognize that there is now the prospect of change. You had mentioned already changes are taking place here. There has been a degree of normalization. Yeah. Uh, UAE, Morocco, Sudan uh, have come forward and Bahrain have come forward with quote-unquote normalization. This normalization, frankly, is meaning. Uh, uh, you know, it has a certain economic content. Real normalization, effective normalization, would be an agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It may be based on the one state, a two-state solution, or in a period of time, possibly even a sensible one-state solution. A, solu- yes. a, a state where... You have every state in the world has people who are minorities and who live yeah. under the constitution that gives them uh, equality of status and opportunity. So I think Israel at some stage will reach that. Mm-hmm. Till then, you need an interim arrangement. See what has happened in the way Israel was constructed. You have this messianic uh, affiliation with land. Land yeah. is held to be sacred. So sacred Uh, that no other entity is allowed to live on it as an equal. Now, this is the position of the ultra-right wing, the ultra-orthodox. Now, if they diminish in power, already, as you know, there are elements, they are right wing, but they are secular right wing. And then, of course, you have a leftist central, uh, center-left coalition. So, there are changes, hopefully. The the, uh, West Asia is so full of hope and so much, so frequently, this hope has translated into despair. Therefore, it's yeah. very difficult to be optimistic at any time. <laughs> but having said this, the departure of Netanyahu for me is <laughs> crucial. It's central and crucial. If once this yeah. government is now, what they are looking, what Netanyahu's group is looking at, is that somehow this contest should be prolonged. Uh, it passes three weeks. They are not able to form the government. And mm. Netanyahu remains in power for another six months and bides his time for the next election. <laughs> That's a nightmare scenario. That's a nightmare scenario. What you mm. should be looking at now is to bring to uh, bring about a ceasefire immediately. I think Biden in this context has sent an emissary to the region. Uh, yeah. Bring about a ceasefire uh, immediately. Not address issues, not resolve issues, Bring about a ceasefire, form a new government, give a chance to the new government to sort itself mm-hmm. out, gain a degree of public support, and then we will see over a period of time how things can change. Mm-hmm. So, last question India, what are we doing? There was some Androdyne statement I recall reading, I think, yesterday. Um, where, do, where do we stand here? I mean, with all these. This is very kind of you to ask that India has a certain position on a certain major issue uh, mm-hmm. of foreign policy. Uh, it is because we are we have been in the business for 30 years or so, yeah. we always want to know what India is thinking. But with all respect, I do not believe anymore for the last two years or so that India has any interest whatsoever in any aspect of foreign policy. Serious interest. Mm-hmm. Therefore, Neither does anyone wait with bated breath on what India is going to say, nor does Mm. India ever have anything interesting to say to anybody. We have more or less abdicated all interest in serious issues. And you know, I have mentioned it to you many times, that West Asia is a region of crucial and abiding interest to India. I have said this. Now, one lady uh, uh, of Indian origin has been killed in Israel in the rocket attack. And I would mention to you, uh, without any exaggeration, and uh, if there is a conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, several thousand Indians will be killed on day. Yeah, yeah. But yet, 
we seem to have no interest whatsoever with regard to a development taking place in West India, where we could have really uh, made a major difference. We are very highly regarded. The situation that India is in, it was not invented day before yesterday. India has been involved with the region for several centuries. Our best leaders have engaged very deeply with the region, have shaped a certain status uh, for our country, and the country they welcome as a presence. Who else but India can talk to Iran and to Saudi Arabia and to yeah, Israel, absolutely. to Qatar and to the UAE and bring wisdom and a degree, you know, I'm not saying that we are, I'm that this is mediation. I'm saying India is good. India yeah, can yeah. help to build confidence. I had help. I had hoped this would happen uh, when I watched the activism of Mr. His first term. But you have, all of you journalists have already pointed out to me that in the second term, uh, uh, there is no interest whatsoever on the part of our government to have any serious interest in any issue that involves uh, foreign policy or a national interest outside our borders. Sir, as always, uh, pleasure talking to you and uh, glad for your insight. Uh, thank you very much, thank sir. You. And let's the uh, situation levels out in uh, uh, Israel and uh, we do see history forming there, shaping up. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, sir. All the best to you. Thank you very much.